welcome to the English with Kirsty podcast from www.englishwithkirsty.com. Here I'll be sharing with you tips, information and other learning resources so that you can improve your business English. Hi everybody and welcome back to the English with Kirsty podcast and today I have another special guest. Welcome Craig, it's good to see you after seven years. We were, we've were we been talking, uh, we started talking about seven years ago because we were planning a collaboration and now we finally made it into the we same We finally series. made this must be one of the longest <laughs> planned collaborations in history, seven years, but we got there in the end. Yeah, Kirstie, we did. And that's, that's what counts. And that's down to you because you messaged me a couple of weeks ago. So thank you for that. And thank you for following up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, tell us something about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What's your connection to languages? Well, I, I'm from London originally, born and raised in London, London, as you can probably guess from my from my accent. I travel quite a bit in my formative years when I was younger, looking for the meaning of life. Okay. I, didn't fi- I didn't find it. So still looking. <laughs> still looking. <laughs> And then at some point while I was traveling, I got interested in teaching English. And then I suddenly realized I had no idea how to teach my own language. So I went back to the UK and took a CELTA course, which is the first step on the ladder of teaching English as a second language and started teaching and thoroughly enjoyed it and realized that I didn't know my my own grammar and I had to learn my own language, the grammar of my own language. I did another qualification, a higher qualification, and then I moved to Spain back in 1997, and that's where I am now. So I worked for the British Council here in Valencia for many years and got made redundant during COVID, Mm -hmm. which led me to uh, becoming self-employed, teaching online, and um, yeah, that's what I'm doing now, teaching English online to to groups of, of students. Okay, so why Spain? If you've travelled around, I mean, Spain's a nice country, but why why Spain specifically? My parents retired here. They've since passed away. They're not with us anymore. But my sister came as well with her husband and they moved to a lovely little place down the coast. But the only place I could get work as a teacher was Valencia. So I thought after many years of being rather selfish and travelling, I thought, oh, why not go and and be close to my family for for a while. So um, that was the reason, simply because they they had already moved here permanently and bought a house. Okay, so you're settled there, and that's one of the nice things about you know if you're working online, you can really be anywhere with a good internet connection. Um, what kind of people do you work with? Like, do you have a a preference what what it's a really good student for you I don't mean academically good but what, what's somebody that you really enjoy working with I enjoy working with one-to-one students when there's a specific goal mm. so I'm not too keen on general English that um, is based around a course book and goes on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks I, I don't find that particularly satisfying but I do love short-term goals like preparing a presentation for work or passing a speaking exam a Cambridge exam or similar or perhaps a job interview preparation Mm. so you can really focus in on what they're trying to achieve and then tailor make and design a a few lessons based around that I I get a lot of satisfaction out of that Uh, and also uh, groups I love working with groups from different countries I like those lessons where you can bring cultural diversity into it and it's like what what is like what is it like in india what is it like for you in in ukraine what is it like for you in south america wherever they're from bringing that point of view into group conversation i find that very very rewarding as well yeah i think you learn something too then don't you, you have the opportunity to learn about other people and cultures and different ways of doing things and that makes I- it interesting I think, yeah, and I think because I spent so many years teaching only Spanish students here in Valencia, ah, okay. which was nice, with uh, lovely, lovely people, but it, it was quite a limited view of the world as well, culturally. 
Um, so I like the eclectic approach of of people from different countries. Yeah, I'm starting to do more of that as well now. And I primarily I was working with German speaking clients, but to be fair, they weren't all German clients, you know, because there's a lot of migration to Germany too. So I I worked with people from from different countries, but now that's kind of increasing. So yeah, it's it's good to to travel all around the world, all around Europe without leaving your desk. I think that's another another fun aspect of it. Exactly. It's it would it wouldn't have been thinkable 25 years ago. So it's uh, it's amazing. It, it really is really has opened doors for me. Yeah, and I think it's um it's great that you can also while do, while you're doing that, learn something about your own language. I was uh, I was thinking when you said that it's true because. I don't know if it's the way that English is taught in England, but I certainly learned a lot more about English when I firstly, when I started learning other languages at school. Um, and then when I when I became a teacher too, it's you understand well, you know, why is it like that? You just, just accept that some things are the way they are. And actually, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. There must be a rule for that. Why, why is it this way? Um, what is your experience with other languages? Which did you have other languages at school? Um, did you... How is it living in Spain? Do you did you do a Spanish course or? Oh, oh, where to start with that one? Well, I learned French <laughs> for five five years at school. Uh, can't speak French, of course, because back in the day we learned from cassettes, and it was repetition, <laughs> and it was very grammar focused, and and hardly any speaking and interaction. So. I like the language. I like French. I can get the gist of a conversation, but I'm I'm hopeless at, at speaking it. Um, Spanish was, yeah, I, I learned Spanish for, briefly before I came over here. I did a short course and my wife is Spanish. So my language learning really took off as soon as I met her. Um, <laughs> you had a reason. <laughs> <laughs> we had a reason to communicate. Uh, so that was nice. But I also had to do some language from formal language courses here in Valencia. So I think it was probably a combination of both the formal language structure and obviously living in the country and using it every day. Uh, that's um, probably the perfect way to, to fluency. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it has to be the combination and it also has to be, you have to have a reason. I, I don't know um, how much it's part of your, your life now, but um, at home, whether your wife speaks English too. But I think if you have this motivation, then it really helps you to, especially at the early stages, it really helps you to to move past the beginner stages. Although and I, want, I want to add though, Kirsty, I need to work on my grammar. My grammar is not good. And I notice it a lot when I'm in Spanish company and we're speaking Spanish with friends and I need to tell an anecdote about something that happened in the past or extended speaking. Then I struggle a bit with sentence structure and grammar tenses. Mm. So I need to work on that. So my my comprehension's fine. My, my vocabulary is pretty good, but I do need to, to go back to the books and learn a bit more grammar, I think. Yeah, it's... But I think it's good if you know that, then you can do something about it as well. It's like sometimes we don't know what we don't know, but if we we realize where our challenges are, then we can do something to address them. But I think also as a teacher, that makes you relatable because you're not like, oh, Mr. Perfect Teacher, like knows. Like if we're <laughs> learning other languages, we too have things that we need to work on or areas that we're not so comfortable with. And I, I think as teachers, that makes us more relatable as well. Yeah, I, I agree. And I just like my students to relax and just feel comfortable. And if they're making mistakes, that's fine. And mm -hmm. I hear mistakes from native speakers of English all the time. Absolutely. And I'm sure I make them myself. So it's more of a of a journey than a than anything else. And you can't wake up one morning and say, Oh, now I know Spanish or <laughs> now I know English. It just doesn't work that way. I learn new English words every week. So you never really finish. And language is changing too. Look at all the new vocabulary we got when the pandemic hit. You know, like yep. all these COVID-related words that we didn't have before. Suddenly, everybody was using them, and everybody knew what they meant. But six months ago, nobody knew that. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. I learned a new expression last week. If you agree with someone in street slang, you can just say "word," and that really? means yeah. Okay. Like if you if you say it's really difficult to learn Romanian, and I say "word." That means, yes, I agree. I agree with you 100%. I mean, I didn't know that. 
I'm not cool enough to know that. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to say it. But, so just let's keep it between us. Let's not put it out there into podcast podcast land. Hope no one's listening. No, they won't. They won't. Or if you are, don't tell anyone. So yeah. don't tell anyone. Keep it. Keep it between us. Well, what's it like for you moving to Spain then? Were there any things that, that were really different in terms of the way people communicated or the way things got done that you found that you had to get used to? Like body, cultural body language was tricky. Okay. In the UK, you tend to keep a bit of a distance and it's not so touchy and close as it is in, in Spain and other Mediterranean countries. So mm. my first week, I was teaching a class at the British Council and in the break not the first week the first month uh, a guy came up to me a young guy and he put his arm around me and he said like, I'm really really sorry Craig I haven't done the homework this week and I felt uncomfortable but of course <laughs> here that's that's the sign of affection for your teacher I would never dream of putting my arm around my teacher in the UK mm. uh, to apologize for something so but you learn that you learn these cultural differences and you, you learn to accept them. So that was one thing that uh, surprised me in my first month here. Yeah. And it's also understanding what that means. Cause in, yeah, in the UK, if someone did that, that would mean something different. That would mean they wanted to be in your space more than, you know, like I think it's a understanding what's happening and then understanding what you want to do about that, whether, whether you're going to adopt these, this body language too or even if you don't it's like okay i know what this person is trying to communicate trying to say by by the way that they're behaving yeah exactly yeah. and you don't get that in books usually like i think that's one of the um interesting things about international communication like i, I was speaking to some german people who moved here and they were living here now working here and about some of the things with english that that, that caused them <laughs> trouble at the beginning and they were saying that it's the English people, it's not about being polite. It's not about, it's about not being very direct or not really telling the truth in some cases, like saying it's okay when it's not okay, or I don't mind when you really do mind, or um, that's interesting when you mean that's stupid. I didn't, why would you do that? You know, interesting doesn't necessarily mean interesting. It's all these hidden things that people are expected to know sometimes in communication. Um which don't always mean what you think they mean. Like if you typed it into a, a translation site, you would get the literal meaning, but then you would also get what people actually want to tell you with that. Um, yeah, well, and I, I guess was, I was watching something on TV uh, yesterday, my sister in English and in the TV series, someone gave somebody else a really horrible present and I opened the present and they said, Oh, wow. I've never seen anything like that in my life. As, but that I mean that's very neutral but but it's not avoid, good <laughs> they're avoiding saying how horrible it is and somebody else says said well I'm speechless wow <laughs> because, <laughs> because so I haven't bad. got anything good to say <laughs> all those yeah. exactly all those hidden meanings that hide yeah. behind words and expressions sometimes yeah that's uh, pragmatics and that's a challenge that yeah. that takes time and that means that Really, it's good to have conversations with real people. Like I say to my students, I guess you say to you, like if you if you talk with real people, you'll find out some of these things. If you only ever read books or articles meant for language learners, maybe they won't be there. But as soon as you start having conversations with real people that use the language, then that's when you discover these challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's really no excuse these days. I mean, in, in the past, you could say, well, I don't live in the UK. I don't live in an English speaking country. But now we've got the internet and we can connect like we're connecting now over over the internet, over Zoom. Then you can have those conversations and practice language with people. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a, a real experience too. You can come across some of those accents, which maybe take a little bit longer to, to figure out, or you can learn some expressions I learned one today, <laughs> thanks to you. But, you know, you can learn things that you maybe won't find in the books, uh, but that people really say. Um, <laughs> so you were saying that you wanted to <laughs> break it. <laughs> Word. <laughs> you wanted, um, you spoke a lot of Spanish, um, or you were speaking with Spanish-speaking students. Um, do you use Spanish in your classes at all? Or do you prefer to, to only speak English? I prefer to speak English if um 
there's a group of only Spanish speakers on the Zoom call, for example, or the same when I used to teach in the classroom. If everybody there was a Spanish speaker, then maybe I'd use it as a shortcut. So instead of going on this long-winded, lengthy description to describe a word that they might or might not understand, I'll just translate it to Spanish Mm. and then move on, but then move on in English. And if the students ever switch or ask me a question in Spanish, then I would answer in English and say, please keep it, keep it in English. That's what we're learning here. But occasionally I use it just to save time if it's possible. What about you? Um, I think it depends who I'm with because I do a lot of one-to-one. And if if somebody doesn't know how to ask a question in English, um, I would rather they ask the question than go away wondering about something. Um, mm-hmm. So I will... I'm open to using German, um, maybe Romanian in my beginner, low intermediate classes. The, the the others don't need it. But if somebody is like, oh, what's this word? Then uh, that's okay. Or I, I really want people to to be able to, to ask so if they don't understand something or they don't understand what we're doing or to the point, then I'd rather explain something in German for a beginner group so everybody knows exactly what we're doing and then we go back to English so I think it's something you shouldn't rely on too much but it's a tool that you can have as you say if everybody speaks the the language that you want to use because if if they don't it can feel quite it can feel like they're being excluded and that's not nice I wouldn't want that but yeah, I've, um, had, I've had that a couple of times actually yeah. with students where the majority of the group were Spanish speakers but might, might, maybe there was one hungarian speaker in the class for example and then of course the other students would ex- would say something in spanish sometimes forgetting that there was one person who yeah, you didn't understand so that you have to no that you have to to say let's keep it in english because so and so can't understand yeah yeah because it feels like you you've got different levels of um, you know the hierarchy depending on who speaks which language and that isn't good but i think one-to-one if somebody has a question and then it's it's okay sometimes, especially mm. for beginners. But yeah, I know some schools, I, I was asking because um, I don't know how it was working for the British Council. I know some of the bigger language schools kind of forbid it. And I think, it, yeah, in, in a multilingual classroom, I can understand, but one-to-one, I think no. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, everyone everyone's different. Um, and speaking about um, the work that you did before, one difference between us is that I don't have a lot of experience in exam preparation. It's not something I focus on at all. And I know that's something that you did do a lot of work on. So sometimes I have podcast listeners who ask about this. So what what kind of tips would you give to people who are thinking about or who have signed up to, to do the Cambridge speaking exam? How can they prepare themselves? And what kind of tips would you give people who, who want to do that? Well, I think it depends if the student is studying with a teacher, either in an academy or a one-to-one teacher, or if they're preparing the exam by themselves. But either way, I think you need a study plan. Um, We can talk about the speaking in particular, if you like, but just generally about the exam. What I would suggest is, is take a mock test, for example, with the reading and use of English and then work on your weaknesses, not your strengths. So sit down mm. with a full exam and do it in an hour and 15 minutes. Don't have any interruptions. Don't use your dictionaries. Don't use the Internet. See what you can do now. Check your answers. and think, oh, I need to work on part two. That was really bad. Or, oh, I'm OK with part three. I can I, I won't need to worry about that. So the idea is to bring up your weak areas so that overall you're going to get a higher mark when you take the exam. And I think that's true to a certain extent with the speaking. But obviously with the speaking, you'd need a teacher because AI is not at that stage yet where it can mm. give you like a really good summary of, of your weak areas in speaking. So, I mean, you could get online with, um, with, a, with a teacher and you can do a test, a formal test, and then get feedback on the areas you need to improve. But generally speaking, just immerse yourself in English as much as possible. And that means reading widely and, and, and varying your, your reading and your listening. Vary your sources. Don't just only watch a TV series like Friends. That's, you have to vary. You have mm-hmm. to listen to the news. You have to listen to different accents. Um, 
music is good as well occasionally that's good for pronunciation and rhythm read blogs about things you're interested in listen to podcasts watch youtube videos use apps on your phone so it's this eclectic approach of trying to suck in and, and get english immerse yourself from as many angles as possible and as many varieties as possible and then at the same time get to know the exam so you need to form some strategies for the listening paper you need to know what kind of reading you need to do for each section are you skimming or scanning the text you need to read for general understanding or specific information and then the use of english has particular strategies to it as well there are many many resources on on youtube and on the web for this so make sure you know the exam especially mm -hmm. the speaking exam before the day when you take it you don't just want to walk into the room and be surprised by the examiner interrupting you when the time is up for your minute of solo speaking. So you really need to know the different parts of the speaking test um, so that there are no surprises on the day. And work on your timing as well when you're writing. And you get 45 minutes to, to do two pieces, of well, one piece of writing, but you need to do two. So that's um, an hour and a half for two pieces of writing. So you decide when you move from one to the other. Oh, okay. And it's yeah. the same with the reading and use of English. You decide when you move from one part to another part. So you need to, to make sure you can do all of the seven parts in the allotted time. And I guess that's even the same with speaking though, because if you know that you have to, that you have a minute and, and you spend too long on the first part and then you don't get to make your most important point, I, I think... I've only worked with a couple of students on this and I thought that some people, they don't know what to say and that's hard, but some people have a lot of ideas and they almost have too much to say because they're nervous. And it's about making sure that you don't run out of time. Otherwise you won't get the points for the good things that you would have said if you'd had the time for them. That's a exactly. lot to think yeah. about. The, the most important thing in the speaking uh, to answer the question, um, and you're sometimes asked to compare photographs and say how they're similar and how they're different of course do that for a few seconds but very very quickly you need to be addressing and answering that question that that's the most important thing and then if you've got time at the end and you've got maybe 10 15 seconds and you don't know what to say you can just personalize one or two of the pictures and say oh I really like this one because I love going to the beach or I really hate traveling by car because of the traffic so if you personalize it that gives you some ammunition it gives you some <laughs> ideas to keep speaking until the examiner says thank you and when the examiner says thank you that means you you have You've to stop it. so don't <laughs> be enough. don't be surprised if that happens in the middle of a sentence that's perfectly normal and what about people who say um like they, they see the topic that they have to talk about and they say i don't know anything about that what can i say about that or i don't have an opinion on that whether this is right or not or um, how do they get past this feeling of like, I have nothing to say, what am I going to do? W what strategies can they use okay. then? Well, for, let's say for the B2 first exam from Cambridge and the C1 advanced to a certain extent, look, the topics are quite general. I mean, you're probably going to get something about the environment, something about climate change, perhaps something about travel and holidays, something about technology. So they're very general topics that you would find in any course book and I think most students will be able to speak about those general topics now when you get to the higher levels more like c2 proficiency then the topics become more abstract but then when you're at that level I mean you you should be able to hypothesize and give opinions about abstract topics um, and if you can't do that and, and you have then I mean, you should be able to in your language, really. And then if you've got that higher level, you should be able to do it in English. So the only thing I can say is just practice. Uh, make sure you look at past papers, past questions. Mm -hmm. What kind of things are they asking? And again, you can find that material on YouTube and just get an idea of the kind of questions they're asking. But definitely a B2 first, then they're going to be quite concrete questions around those known topics of sort of nature and and uh, work and holidays and that kind of thing 
Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I wouldn't encourage people to lie, but the, the examiner doesn't know whether this is actually your opinion. They really want to know whether you can express an opinion in English. So exactly. And the answer yeah. is better than no answer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why not? I mean, it, yeah, if it if it comes up, then just lie. <laughs> just make, <laughs> we didn't make, say that. Make, some, make something up. Yeah. Be you creative. That sounds through. better than like. Um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> did you say that you'd made some resources to help people who are studying for this exam? Yeah, on YouTube, on the um, on the YouTube channel I have at M Mansion Inglés, it's La Mansion del Inglés, which I could probably spell later if you want me to. But there are many, many videos about the B2 first exam. So if anyone's preparing for that, you're welcome to go and have a look. There's a playlist of Cambridge B2 first videos that take you through all the different parts of the exam step by step and break down what you should be doing for each each part. So that includes the listening, the speaking, the um, writing and the reading and use of English. Yeah, I'm sure that would be very useful. Um because sometimes you just need to take that methodical approach like to look at what there is in the exam and then you know, what you need to do for those different parts. And if you've, if you've broken that down for them, I think that'd be really helpful. So we'll include the link to that on the show notes page as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing we need to talk about is um, your podcast. So that's that's another way that people can find out about you know what you're doing and what, what kind of podcast do you have? Um, what do you do on the podcast and, and who's the podcast for? It's for anybody who wants to improve their English. And if you have a good B1 level, let's say, uh, I hope you'll, you'll find it useful. You shouldn't have any problems understanding us. I have a co-host, a good friend who is still working at the British Council. Strangely, he managed to keep his job, <laughs> which <laughs> probably says more about him than it does about me. But um, <laughs> we do the podcast together. And um, we absolutely love it. We've been doing it since 2014. We just passed our 500th episode that we're wow. very proud of. And it's a weekly show. And together, we, we basically, the we like to say that there's nothing, there's nothing has ever stopped us talking about things we know absolutely nothing about. So <laughs> sometimes okay. we, we touch on topics that really um, we don't know anything about, but we're using them as a medium to to help you with your English. So obviously we talk about grammar, vocabulary, listening skills, all that, all those good things. But we also talk about very, very general things as well, more abstract topics and um, anything that the audience wants us to talk about or anything that we can think of. So it's very varied and uh, hopefully entertaining as well. We try and make it fun. Yeah, because that's I think language learning should be fun and I think if people can enjoy themselves enjoy the podcast that they're listening to then they're more likely to to remember things and to, to keep listening um where do you get your inspiration from then do you get a lot of requests from from the listeners or do you is it everyday life that gives you your ideas or? we do know we get uh, quite a bit of feedback we like to get voice feedback so there's a there's a button on the web page that you can go over to and leave 90 seconds of voice feedback. And ah. we, as long as we can understand what you're saying, and I don't just mean from a language perspective, I mean that the audio is is understandable, then we, we mm. put it in the podcast um, as a short listening piece, and then we'll comment on what you've said. So, you know, very often people will ask a question or they'll make a comment about a previous episode or they'll suggest a, a topic and then we'll speak about that topic. So we do get a lot of feedback from the audience. And then when we're stuck, um, yeah, we just we just think of think of things to talk about. And um, it can be anything from we've done one recently on uh, cakes and pastries, just because we Ooh. like. I've got a very sweet tooth. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> we we tend to have quite a large uh, Spanish audience following us. So we've done, we focus on different Spanish speaking countries in the past. So we've done a podcast on um, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, Latin American countries, Mexico. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, but just very varied, very different topics. And we try and cover uh, as, as wide as wide audience as we can. That's cool. I think it's, it's nice that you get the listener feedback as well, because it, I mean, 
I've had written feedback and I'm always happy to get feedback, but I, it didn't occur to me to have this option for people to leave feedback. I think that's cool. I think it's it's nice that people do that as well who are learning because sometimes it takes a bit of courage, you know, to click that record button and, and, and say something in another language. But I think it's it says something about you if your listeners feel relaxed and confident enough to do that. Well, hopefully they do. And obviously, with you know, the more feedback we get, the the more we think, oh, great, you know, more more people are listening. So yeah, and it also gives the the students a chance to to record and send something, hear their voice on the podcast. Mm. But when you're recording like that, first of all, obviously you need courage to be able to do it. Yeah. But then you might record it and think, oh, I don't like that very much. I'm going to try again. So then you record it again and you record it again. But well, of course, that's great practice. There's nothing better for your speaking than re-recording and improving your pronunciation each time or maybe thinking of a better expression. So that re-recording process is also very useful. So are you allowed to do that or does it check before it sends or do you have to send multiple? No, I use something. We use a service called SpeakPipe, which is free. You just embed it in the WordPress website and you click on it and you record. It it cuts off after 90 seconds. So if you don't finish your message, you could always send another one as well. Uh, but then if you're, if you're not happy, then you don't send it. You, you, okay, you have the delete option. it. Yeah, you delete it yeah, and then cool. record again. Yeah, well, that's that's a cool idea. It kind of brings listeners' voices to life. I like that exactly, idea. Exactly. So where can people find out more about you? I will include all the links, but where's the best place to, to find out what you're up to and to connect with you online? Well, my website is at englishcraig.com. That's Craig, C-R-A-I-G.com. And I need to link my podcast website to my main website. So I'll be doing that hopefully next week but the podcast website is inglespodcast.com and that's i-n-g-l-e-s podcast p-o-d-c-a-s-t dot com that's where the podcast lives or wherever you get your podcast wherever you get Kirsty's podcast <laughs> exactly so the, the website is where people can find out about your one-to-one -one lessons your group lessons if they have um if they're preparing for the the Cambridge exam I guess they can um, organize something with you there do you still do tuition for that or yes I do yeah as I mentioned before if you're preparing for a speaking tests I'm more than happy to to jump on zoom with you and give you a, a mock a practice test and then give you feedback on how I think you would do in the exam and how you can maybe get a better mark so yeah feel free to reach out englishcraig.com okay and are you um around on any of the social media channels or do you prefer to Send I am. Yeah, site. there are links. There are links to those on um, on the website. Uh, I haven't really been active on um, on Instagram or TikTok. I've got, as I said before, videos on YouTube, and I'm trying to get more active on LinkedIn. I know you're quite keen yeah, on LinkedIn I as like a platform. <laughs> so I do like LinkedIn, but there just seems to be so many places these days. Kirsty, yeah, you, you have to choose. You have, you have to, to choose. Choose and selective. focus on that thing. Yeah, so I'll try to post more on on uh, LinkedIn in the future. Okay, well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. It's been really good speaking with you and, and getting your tips. And um, My pleasure. yeah, wishing you all the best. And yeah, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the English with Kirsty podcast. If you have any questions or comments, my email address is kirsty at englishwithkirsty.com or you can go to www.englishwithkirsty.com slash podcast where you'll find information about the individual episodes.